Hello, and welcome to the third installment in our virtual learning series for spring term 2014. I'm Mark Connor, Associate Provost and Professor of English, and I'm joined today by Nadia Ayub in the Biology Department. And Nadia, you're teaching a course called Genetic Engineering and Society. That sounds really interesting to me, and I don't know much about it. So what can you tell me about this course? Um, so I, I'm a geneticist, and actually really an evolutionary biologist, mm. uh, but when I was thinking about courses that would appeal to non-science majors, I wanted to be able to make use of my expertise, my research expertise in genetics, mm -hmm. but also to bring in things that, topics that would have broad appeal to people who are not scientists. And it's almost like a little outreach event in my mind. Hmm. Um, so genetic engineering is this broad slew of methods that are used by almost every geneticist, physiologist, biologist of any shape. Um, and it's very simple methods in a, in a way. Um, but it has a lot of implications. Mm -hmm. And some of those implications are just about creating knowledge in biology, how we have really learned so much about molecular processes by using what we call genetic engineering. Hmm. Um, but then there are a lot of ethical and moral and political implications that come out of these methods as well. And so I try to touch on all of these things in the class. Okay. And I should also credit Professor Bob Goldberg at University of California in Los Angeles. I stole this idea from, from him, but it's okay <laughs> because he was funded by the National Science Foundation to develop a course that he called, I think, Genetic Engineering in Agriculture, Medicine, and the Law, or something mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and uh, I really very liberally borrowed from his readings mm -hmm. and um, the way that he developed the course. But his course was a you know 14 week, mm -hmm. they meet once a week, I don't, I'm not sure if they had a lab or not even. Um, so I, I really had to modify it to fit our four week. Right, term. right, very interesting. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna hear more about that in a little bit. So, so genetic engineering, now let's say you're explaining to a, to a 12 year old, or even worse, to an English professor, <laughs> right? And they were to say, so what, what exactly do we mean by genetic engineering? What, what are we talking sure. about here? So there's, there's multiple things we have to consider if we're gonna consider genetic engineering. So the first thing is, what is a gene? Okay, so we can define genes lots of ways. How would you define a gene? You're not supposed to ask me hard questions like that. <laughs> uh, sort well, of that's the, not a hard question. The building you block walk... of life, something like that. Okay, so you could walk into my class and I'm gonna ask that right away. Mm -hmm. What do you think is a gene? And I'm gonna get different answers. So you just told me the building block of life. Okay. So I actually asked my students yesterday, what, what do you think is a gene? And I got, oh, a segment of DNA. Mm -hmm. okay, I got um, uh, a trait passed to your offspring. Okay. Okay, I got um, a trait passed to your offspring that controls a trait. Okay. Um, uh, a segment of DNA that codes for a protein. All right. So I got, okay. I asked 12 students and I got almost 12 different responses, but they all had some underlying themes. Mm, okay. right? So genes control traits and they're passed from parents to offspring. Right? But how does that happen? <laughs> how does that happen? Well, there's, there is a molecule in every cell of our body and in every cell of every cellular organism out there called DNA, which I'm sure you've heard of. I have. I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my hope <laughs> that even English professors will get to. Even uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so DNA is um, the, the molecule that holds information. It carries information. Actually, I should say it stores information. So DNA stores information and it's also copied and passed to offspring. Mm -hmm. So a cell, every time it makes a copy of itself, it has to copy everything in that cell. But most importantly, it copies the DNA mm -hmm. because the DNA stores all the information for making traits. Okay. Right. okay. I'm with you so far. All right, great. <laughs> so a gene is just a segment of DNA that has the information for 
a very specific trait. Okay. Okay. But, but genes on the, that segment of DNA, one little segment of DNA um, is, is going to have information for lots of things. It could, it could have information for lots of different things. But at the simplest level, a segment of DNA eventually gets made into a protein. It has the information for making a protein. Mm -hmm. And actually a very complicated process by which the DNA is um, transcribed, is the word we use, into what's called an RNA molecule. Mm -hmm. And the RNA molecule is actually translated then into a protein. So that's what we call central dogma, and that's all of biology is now built around this idea that DNA stores the information, RNA is the little messenger molecule, and that's actually going to be translated to a protein, and then it's proteins that make our traits. Okay. And it's the combination of a lot of proteins that actually are going to make most of our traits. Mm -hmm. So very few traits are, are, can be traced back to just one protein. But um, say the pigment in our skin, melanin, uh, that is going to be controlled. The, the melanin itself is one protein, but then the pathway to actually get to the point where you can make melanin, melanin there's going to be multiple proteins in mm. that pathway mm -hmm. to where you can actually make the melanin. Mm -hmm. And each of those proteins um, is controlled by a different gene. So there's a different segment of DNA that's going to code for each of these proteins. And actually, DNA has information for other kinds of molecules that I don't talk about in this class that much, but I make everybody aware that mm -hmm. they exist. Okay. Okay. So, so what is it that is involved with genetic engineering? Right. <laughs> so it's really what it sounds like. You're engineering DNA. So instead of, so we've actually manipulated DNA for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So we have made crops, domesticated crops, we've domesticated animals, and we selectively breed those animals and plants to get traits we want. Okay. And, and we make use of their genes, essentially. But that, that process involves controlling the reproductive process, right. you know, who breeds with who. Mm -hmm. And we can do a lot of pretty fancy crosses to get traits that we want. We can make blue corn, red corn, right. corn with high starch content, low starch content, just by doing this selective breeding. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a pretty long, laborious process. But we've done that for tens of thousands of years now. And that's basically a kind of rough and, genetic engineering. And that is a rough genetic engineering. Okay. So we have done it for a long time. Mm -hmm. What's new now, and that we could start doing 40 years ago, um, as of November 2013, <laughs> the first paper was published. <laughs> um, not 2004, yeah, as of November 2013, <laughs> 40 years ago, okay. um, is directly manipulate the DNA. Mm. So, in, you know, in the past, we were really stuck with organisms where we could get them to breed with each other, right. to have sex with each other. And now what, what we can do is actually take the DNA of any species, combine it with the DNA of any other species. Now we've got a new DNA molecule that's mm -hmm. never existed in any organism. And we can insert that new DNA molecule that's just, it's just bare, naked DNA. Well, it's in, probably in an aqueous solution. It's probably in water. Um, and then we can get that DNA into a third organism, potentially and have that third organism copy the DNA for us. Mm -hmm. And hopefully even make a protein from it. Right. Now you talked earlier about all the complex steps of getting you know, one little trait carried on to another. What happens when we start mixing and matching DNA in the way you're describing? Like you just said, take this and this and then put it into that and then hopefully, but there's a lot of hopefully there, right? A lot of things that could go wrong, a lot of, um, it sounds very complicated to me. Right, so, so sure, you can take any DNA, try to insert it into some other organism, and the organism is going to think it's foreign DNA and try to get rid of it. So for instance, bacteria are infected by viruses all the time. Mm -hmm. And viruses, what they do is inject DNA or RNA into the bacterial cell and try to take over the bacteria's machinery 
replicate themselves instead of the bacteria and burst open the, the cell and go off and infect other hmm. bacteria. Viruses okay. do that to us too. Mm -hmm. So we all, bacteria and humans, have mechanisms for getting rid of that foreign DNA. Mm. And, and so you're right, we have to bypass these mechanisms so that the, the bacteria or we don't get rid of that foreign DNA. Mm -hmm. So we have to actually make use of some of our native mechanisms for replicating DNA so, so we don't do that. So the, the very first experiment that published um, a bacterium growing foreign DNA made use of a naturally occurring piece of DNA called a plasmid, which is just a little circular piece of DNA. Um, a plasmid is, uh, I haven't told you the units of DNA. Not that I can recall. What are the units of DNA, do you know? I do not. Okay, <laughs> so, so DNA is made of um, nucleotides. Mm -hmm. So those are the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar. Okay. So it's this, the particular sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's that's encoding all this information that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So this is like a digital storage unit. And, and because we have so many uh, nucleotides in our, in our DNA, we can make virtually unlimited combinations mm -hmm. to encode all of this information. Um, so in a bacteria, a bacteria has two, usually has its own DNA, and that a bacterial DNA, like E. coli, which makes, gives you diarrhea, but mm -hmm. also just lives in our guts naturally most mm -hmm. of the time, um, that E. coli bacterium, it has a, a, its own DNA that's one million nucleotides long. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but some E. coli will also have these little circular pieces of DNA that are maybe 10,000 nucleotides long, so quite a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And bacteria are able to exchange these little circular pieces of DNA with each other. So one cell can get together with another cell and exchange that piece mm. of DNA. Okay. They, they are also able to just take up that DNA from the environment. So you put bare, naked, circular piece of DNA in a water solution with a bacterial cell and put it in the right conditions and the bacterial cell will actually suck up that circular piece of DNA. Okay. okay. All right. So that circular piece of DNA, what's it doing in the bacterial cell? The bacterial cell doesn't have to have it, doesn't need it to do most of its functions. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that little circular piece of DNA has useful genes on it. So from the point of view of a bacteria, a really useful gene is antibiotic resistance. Okay. So um, E. coli have little plasmids that carry genes that will allow them to evade penicillin. Hmm. You are always told, take all your antibiotics so your mm -hmm. bacteria don't evolve and start having antibiotic resistance. Um, where do they get that antibiotic resistance from? A lot of the time it's from picking up these little circular pieces of DNA. Mm. And bacteria can very rapidly exchange these, and so they very quickly become resistant to antibiotics. Very interesting, okay. So the, the little circular piece of DNA has, has these useful genes for a bacteria. We may not think that's useful, but the bacteria certainly right. is gonna proliferate if it has that little circular piece of DNA. Um, and that little circular piece of DNA also has a specific sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's of nucleotides that, that the cell recognizes to replicate, to copy that little circular piece of DNA. Mm -hmm. So the first experiments that were done with combining DNA of one species with another species made use of these little circular pieces of DNA. So we could extract that little circular piece of DNA from a bacterium, isolate it, and actually then cut it up using various methods until that little circular piece of DNA is left with a gene for resistance to antibiotics and a gene for replication. So now it's much smaller mm -hmm. than it was originally. And 
we know most of the sequence of that little circular piece of DNA. So now that little circular piece of DNA, it will grow in a bacteria just fine because it's got that information for replication. Right. And it's got a gene for antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, challenge our bacteria with antibiotics, the only bacteria that will grow are the ones that have this little circular piece of DNA. Hmm. All right, so the first experiment that was done was just to combine two different plasmids together, two different circular pieces of DNA. Mm -hmm. See if the bacteria would grow it. Well, bacteria grew it. Okay, the next experiment was to combine um, DNA from uh, the bacteria that causes staph. Probably heard of staph. I have. And a horrible disease, mm -hmm. resistant to all kinds of antibiotics now. Um, well, the reason that staph is resistant to all these antibiotics is it has its own little circular piece of DNA. Okay. Okay, so the question was wow, well, your gut bacteria, E. coli, would it grow a DNA that came from a staph? These are very, very distantly related bacteria. Hmm. They normally would not exchange DNA. Um, so took that staph little plasmid that had resistance to penicillin, combined it with the E. coli piece of DNA that had resistance to a different antibiotic. Voila, now the bacteria is resistant to both wow. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that this might have created some fear in the <laughs> yeah. initial experiments, right. but, but the people who were doing these experiments were actually very careful to choose um, combinations of antibiotic resistance that already existed in nature. So, uh, so, so they weren't introducing new resistances. Exactly, How interesting. exactly. Okay. So E. coli, there were E. coli that already existed naturally that were resistant to both you know, tetracycline and penicillin. Mm. So when they combined the staph DNA with the E. coli, with this, this other plasmid, um, it created this resistance to two different antibiotics. It was still actually something that existed in nature. I see. So they weren't creating a bacteria that could go out and infect us right. and make us all sick. Right. There must be such uh, uh, complicated and important rules of ethics in this kind of research. Uh, that must be a big part of the training that one gets, right? When you're becoming a biologist, a geneticist, sure. et cetera. Sure. So, so in 1973, when that was when the first paper was published, mm. the, the, the people who were doing those experiments were very careful about what kinds of DNA they would actually put together mm -hmm. and have grow in a bacteria. Mm -hmm. And there was a, just a flurry of self-regulation by scientists. Um, and then the NIH got involved, which is the Natu National Institutes mm -hmm. of Health. Yeah. And essentially by 1977, um, formal policies were put into place mm -hmm. about regulating these combinations mm -hmm. of DNA and having you know, a bacteria grow it. Um, and because it was like very unclear what's going to be safe, you know, mm -hmm. is it safe to put a disease-causing gene into a bacteria? Is it safe to put a cancer-causing gene into a bacteria? Like, there was all this like hype. We could learn so much about the disease, or we mm -hmm. could learn so much about what causes cancer if we could put those genes into a bacterium and study just that one protein. Um, but people were really scared. Like, right. what what are going to be the implications? Right. And then, interestingly enough, you know, another three years later, and we're realizing, well, this is actually really safe, and we know how to contain these better than we actually know how to contain bacteria in general. Um, our lab bacteria, hmm. uh, we've actually selected for lab bacteria that die outside of the lab. Okay. So we created like biological containment. <laughs> I shouldn't say we, I wasn't even, I was, <laughs> I was a very small child then. <laughs> <laughs> um, the scientific community. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, you know, essentially with, within seven years, this process went from something that was generating a lot of fear and concern and self-regulation to a routine molecular process that mm -hmm. anybody going through a biology degree was going to have to learn. Okay. Um, and yes, there are regulations. But like now, I can do these kinds of experiments with my students mm. at WNL, mm -hmm. and I filled out one form when I started here, and we're all clear and mm -hmm. can do genetic engineering whenever we want. 
I can't, I can't engineer cancer-causing genes. <laughs> That's still, you know, it's still like more strongly regulated. All right. So All depending right. on what you're working with, the, the amount of regulations go up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about people who disregard the regulations? What about biological terrorism? What about these, these fears that we get in the media? And I'm thinking of all the, the terrible dystopia movies that I've seen over the years. Are these well-founded or is this more in the realm of fantasy? It's really in the realm of fantasy. I mean, biological warfare can be done with naturally existing bacteria mm. more easily than ones that we engineer. Okay. Um, chemical warfare happens. It's horrible, mm -hmm. but it happens. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it's not as if you're you're giving tools to people that they don't already have even better not. tools than. <laughs> absolutely yeah. not. And, 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 and it's true that, that those, I guess, people in the wrong hands could, could potentially do that, but that is why we put into place regulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of this work, it's not so cheap, so. Right, right. You need enormous facilities, training, equipment, et cetera. Okay. So, so going back to genetic engineering, what are, some of the, what are some of the positives? Like, what are some of the things that make this so appealing to our culture today, to our, to our populations? What, what, are, what are some of the payoffs here? Okay, so there, there's so many. I mean, so the first of all, we can now make a bacteria make any protein from any organism, almost. And what that means is that we can get huge quantities of protein in a relat relatively cheap manner relatively mm -hmm. cheap manner. So one of the first proteins that was of a really big interest was insulin. So mm -hmm. insulin is something that diabetics have to be injected with routinely because they can't make their own insulin. Right. They have uh, problems associated with glucose metabolism. They need insulin. Mm -hmm. And um, the source of insulin in the 70s was to isolate it from pigs or cows or sheep. And that was very expensive, and there was um, always the possibility that the person being injected with that insulin would have an allergic reaction mm. and wouldn't accept this insulin from a, a different species. So there was a lot of interest in being able to take the human gene for insulin and have a bacteria grow it and make that protein. Um, because then the likelihood of, the hum of a person rejecting a human-based insulin is very, very low because it essentially is mimicking our own insulin sure. perfectly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, growing bacteria is actually much cheaper than growing a pig or a cow. Okay, and, see and, that. You know, just harvesting insulin from it. And so that actually ended up being the first protein that was made by a bacteria and then used for mass or not mass, but for some bigger use, you right. know, for medical right. use in this That's case. That's a good example. I can hold on to that one. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's like pharmaceutical, so, medical... So, so since then, we have manufactured many, many, many different kinds of drugs um, using other organisms. And uh, so bacteria were the first organisms, E. coli specifically. Um, to manufacture these proteins, but now we can get goats to manufacture them. They'll make the protein in their milk, and now mm. we have this massive quantity of milk that you can get that protein from. Or uh, there's a lot of interest in getting crops to make vaccines now for mm. us, and, the, and then potentially being an edible vaccine that could be shipped to you know, any part of the world rather than having to send out a doctor to give injections of a vaccine. Wow. All right. Um, crops mm -hmm. have been genetically engineered so that they are naturally resistant to uh, pests. So they'll kill off a caterpillar if a caterpillar is trying to eat a corn plant. Hmm. Instead of spraying your corns with pesticide, mm -hmm. then just have it naturally make a toxic protein and it kills the caterpillars. So when people talk about you know, organic agriculture, is this on one side or the other of that sort of thing? Because I know, I know where pesticides would be, but where would these genetically modified 
product be? Right, so this is a really interesting dichotomy to me because most people who practice organic farming mm -hmm. would probably not want to use what we call now genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, we can actually, we're not necessarily using chemical fertilizers or chemical pesticides and the, the use of these genetically modified crops can actually reduce the amount of chemicals that we're applying to crops. Mm -hmm. But most organic farmers would probably not choose to use a genetically modified organism. Okay. And, and what would you say if, if I were a farmer from Rockbridge County and I said, oh, I don't want to use these GMOs in my products, I'm, I'm organic, what would, what would your response be? Well, they really probably shouldn't use them, and this is the reason. <laughs> Not okay. because GMOs are dangerous to our health or necessarily the environment, but because most of them have been patented, and you have to buy the seeds from a big company like Monsanto. Hmm. Um, so Monsanto makes amazing corn seeds, rice seeds, uh, wheat seeds um, that carry these toxic proteins that will kill off caterpillars. That's great, because now you don't have to apply pesticides. Right. But what it does mean is you have to buy your seed from Monsanto every single season, and you cannot take the seeds that come from your, you can't take your corn and replant it. You would be infringing on the patent right of Monsanto. Wow, really? Yeah, that's interesting. So there's, so there's ownership even of the, of the offspring. Of the yes, GMO. and that's because the offspring carry this extra gene. And so, so one thing we actually debate in our class, which we'll do next week, mm -hmm. is should, should we be able to patent an organism? Because you know, you're essentially patenting a seed. Right, right. Can you patent that seed? Because mm -hmm. you know, like, we are not supposed to be able to patent life forms. Um, but Monsanto has won every court case about pat patenting these. Hmm. These genetically modified seeds. Fascinating. And are there are there uh, health concerns with these sorts of GMOs? Like are there things about, whoa, great, we don't have pesticides to kill the caterpillars, <laughs> but when I eat this corn, it's gonna I'm gonna grow a third arm or something like so that. So that was a huge concern for a long time. You know, what is that, you know, what is it gonna do to us if there's a toxic protein mm -hmm. in in my corn? Right. And so that so that you use that word toxic with corn and yeah, I think that's yeah, so sure doesn't I want to sound good, this. right? <laughs> so the so it's actually making a, a protein that's very specific to insects. Mm -hmm. That's toxic to insects and is targeting um, insect pathways. So no all the research that's been done shows that that particular protein is not toxic in humans. Well, that being said, How some reassuring. others, yeah. some others, you know, and, and it has to, it had to go through 10 years of FDA approval, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, a much more uh, rigorous um, line of approval than, than um, a lot of the foods that go through FDA. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but a lot of, there is still a lot of resistance to genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do worry about the health side effects. Mm -hmm. um, even mm -hmm. though there has not been any clear research showing that any of these genetically modified organisms have any human repercussions. Mm -hmm. These crops seem to be fine. Okay. Um, there's more concern ecologically about escape. Like, could these genes escape the corn plant mm -hmm. and get out into naturally occurring corn? Corn is not such a worry because um, Tiocinti, which is the native relative of corn, doesn't do a whole lot of hybridization with, with domestic corn. And they're all in South America. Um, but some other kinds of genetically modified organisms are more likely to actually exchange pollen Mm. eggs um, with surrounding wild species. Hmm. So that's a concern. Um, and then what would that, you know, if, if your native wild species now have some insecticide in them, what's that going to do to the moth populations that you're really interested in? Mm -hmm. So there was a big scare with um, the monarch butterfly. A whole population of monarch butterflies died off because mm -hmm. they had eaten 
some plants that were genetically modified mm -hmm. to be insecticides. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people love their monarch butterflies. Um, so you know, what if, if there's a big release of these kinds of uh, genes out into the native populations, right. and then our native insects that we actually like, mm -hmm. and are even the ones we don't like, but are probably very important for the ecology. Like serving a very important purpose. Exactly. These are very complex <laughs> systems. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What effect is that going to have? And that's like probably a bigger concern mm -hmm. than our than the what how it would affect our health. Right. Because that gets so complicated, doesn't it? There's so many variables. It'd be very hard to predict all of the effects mm -hmm. from inside a laboratory, it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's still a, you know, a big area of ongoing research. Mm -hmm. what, is the, what are the impl ecological implications of these genetically modified organisms? At what rate do they actually exchange genes with native sure. species? Mm -hmm. um, what's the likelihood of native populations of insects eating a genetically modified organism? Right. Um, and, and so far, most of the research is showing that plants actually don't want to express these genes. They're, they're costly. And hmm. so, okay. <laughs> so actually, even if the gene does escape and hybridize with a native species, um, that's going to cost them in terms of growth in some other respect. And so they may not actually grow as well, not hmm. do very well, and, okay. and thus not proliferate. But, but it still is a big area of research. So I don't want to come down on genetically modified organisms are great mm -hmm. and we shouldn't worry about them at all. Um, there still are definite ecological concerns. Okay. Now what about genetic modification engineering? We've talked about it in, in plants and everything. What about in human beings? What, what's the state of research there? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's called gene therapy mm. right now. And um, there's there's a lot of interest in gene therapy. So modifying, you know, inserting either a correct gene from another human into mm -hmm. your own DNA so that you now make the correct protein. A correct gene? A correct gene. Okay. <laughs> to replace my incorrect? To re replace gene. your incorrect uh -huh. gene. So, so I'll use an example of an incorrect gene. Good. Um, so people who have hemophilia mm -hmm. cannot make a blood clotting factor. So people like, uh, have you, you've heard of the Queen Victoria and her family who had, had a, so Queen Victoria didn't have hemophilia, but she had all these offspring who mm -hmm. um, did have hemophilia. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem that they have is you, you get a cut and you start to bleed. Well, most of us, we make clotting factors right. that, that cause that, that bleeding to stop. And, um, and that's a protein. And there's, there's actually two different kinds of hemophilia caused by problems in two different proteins. So um, pretty recently, there actually were clinical trials with taking a gene that codes for the correct protein that will actually clot blood mm -hmm. and having that gene replicate in the cells of people who have a non-functional copy of that gene. Mm -hmm. And these, these individuals were then able to actually make the clotting factor, and now they're not you know, bleeding constantly. Wow. Yeah. Um, the more common kind, the hemophilia A, there, that one has not progressed to clinical trials. But there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest in using gene therapy for um, those kinds of diseases, mm -hmm. where it's just one gene that encodes one protein, and we know exactly what the problem is in the protein. So if we can turn off, turn off the problem protein, inject the correct protein, mm -hmm. and make that protein now, then, and, and because it's the gene, it's in the DNA, you've got it forever, and it mm. just replicates along with the rest of your DNA, okay. making the correct. Copy. Now that sounds very simple, right? Turn off the bad one, turn on the good one, right. put it in, everything is great. Right, great. <laughs> Must be enormously complicated. So right? it, it actually is enormously complicated. And the only types of gene therapy that have even gone to clinical trials are for diseases that you really are very likely to die. Mm -hmm. This is like last resort 
so far. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, chronic lymphocyte leukemia is another good mm. example of a recent um, gene therapy. And that was you know, clinical trials on three patients who were on death doorstep. Um, and these individuals who have had the gene therapy, uh, what happens is that now they've been injected with, with, uh, with essentially killer cells that will mm. go and kill the tumors. And amazingly enough, killed the tumors. Problem, it's going to continue killing those cells. Mm -hmm. And those lymphocytes are needed to make antibodies. So now you're going to have to get another injection to make the antibodies because you're killing off the cells. Right. The right. So you, know, you don't want to necessarily jump in and start doing gene therapy because yeah. there can be big repercussions. Yeah, proceed with caution, no mm -hmm. doubt, no mm -hmm. doubt. So how are our students doing in this course, when you teach this course? Uh, you've got, of course, as you said, this is a, a lab science course, but it's for non-majors. So these are not your, your organic chemistry, pre-med, I eat up science for breakfast type students necessarily. How, how do they respond to this and how do they do in your class? So they love this moral, ethical, okay. policy, <laughs> all the implications. They love that stuff. And mm -hmm. as long as I'm talking about, you know, kind of broad scope science at the mm -hmm. level I've been talking to you right now, they're, right. they're fine with all that too. Okay, there's genes. And you're taking them into a lab. We can combine right? DNA. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, if I, when, when I take that next step to, okay, we really do have to understand some mechanisms mm -hmm. here, what, what's going on. Um, or even just very simple, you need to understand how we can go from a, a data, <laughs> an image, to an interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, at first, they're, mu they're a little resistant because mm -hmm. they're scared. They're mm -hmm. a little bit scared. Um, but usually by the end of the term, and it's really nice actually at the spring term festival last year, I was so excited when I was overhearing my two students with their poster. They were like, telling somebody, I was so scared of taking my science lab. I didn't know what I was going to do. But look what we did. We engineered this spider gene. And we learned all this stuff about genetics. And they were so excited. So mm -hmm. um, they, they do come around. But that first day, when I like start throwing terms at them. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> deer in the headlights. <laughs> yeah. Now, how is it teaching this course in the spring term? Four weeks, very intensive. This is the one course they're taking. Is that, is that a, a real positive for this class? What, 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 what's the effect of teaching it in the four-week term for you? What does that allow you to do? So, I don't try to lecture at all. And I really try to keep it discussion-based. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's more about, like, the lab days, we start at 10 and we end at 4.30 and we still haven't done everything I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And we're all exhausted. Not me, way more than my students, I think. Um, so I like that I have them all, all the time. Mm -hmm. Because I don't worry about them, you know, prioritizing some other class over this one. Right. And right, you've got them. I've got them. Mm -hmm. And they really, they do everything I ask them to do. But I think what I want is to know that they're putting in as much time as I am. Or maybe not as much time, but that 35 to 40 hours oh, they're sure. supposed to put yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I queried that. I always mm -hmm. query. And uh, I got a whole range from... I spent 20 hours a week on this class, up to I spent more than 40 hours a week mm -hmm. on this class. Right. And we have 18 hours of contact time. So, <laughs> so, and everybody passed. And in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to pass if you only put in two hours a week outside of class. Right. I mean, I you know, any other class that, I teach, that would not happen. <laughs> with that question, do they mean on top of the contact time? Right. Well, I made it very yeah. clear include contact time with the professor. Now, they may not have read it, mm -hmm. in which case, great. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I really would like that to pan out mm -hmm. in a great differential. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot of fun. The, the students really enjoy it. Yeah. And, and they, they really do focus on it. And I, and I don't have to worry about their, priority, their priorities. I know what their priority is. Mm -hmm. 
and, and really it's for me more about how can I turn a non-science majors class into some, you know, a project-based class that mm -hmm. they, can, they can really take more ownership of. Mm -hmm. Because these genetic engineering methods, you can't come in off the street and do them. I still really have to do a lot of hand holding mm -hmm. to, to train them on the methods. And in mm -hmm. four weeks, by the, the end of the four weeks, I could actually take those students into my lab and they could probably do independent research for me. Wow. Um, because they've gotten all the tools that right. they need. Right. But they're never going to work in my lab. <laughs> you know, these are not <laughs> students who want to work with me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it's great from the perspective of convincing them that science is important mm. and that it's not as scary as they thought it was mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. they might think about it you know, later on. Yeah. Well, when I think of science and its place in the liberal arts curriculum, you know, this just sounds so inspiring. The way they get these tools, they get into the lab, they really do learn to the point where they could proceed with research. They at least understand what the research enterprise mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. in science, but then also being so energized by the ethical debates, the legal debates, mm -hmm. the historical debates that you talk about. It sounds like a really ideal liberal arts course <laughs> yeah. in so many ways. Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is a yeah. lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. <laughs> so you do all of this work with spiders and spider silk. That's kind of your, your specific angle on this. Can you explain That's this a right. bit to me? That's right. So I completely left out when you asked me what are the applications what I actually am applying. <laughs> um, so I actually study spider silk. So probably everybody has seen a spider web, mm -hmm. I hope. I mean, anybody who's walked out of the house should, oh, you don't have to walk out of the house. This is probably a very clean room, but my house has spider webs in it. <laughs> um, so that, those webs are made of silk. And silk is just, it's a fiber that's made of protein. That means that there's genes that encode those proteins. Mm -hmm. Now, why would we want to genetically engineer spider silk proteins? That was my next question. These are amazing fibers. So imagine a teeny tiny fiber that can hold the weight of a spider. All right, so you've got a spider. A spider's not that big, but have you ever seen a black widow? Or some of those orb weaving spiders can get this big. Mm -hmm. um, and the fiber that it's hanging from is incredibly thin. We're talking much less than a millimeter. Much, much, much less than a millimeter. Sure. And so for, for that cross-sectional area, that fiber has to be really strong. And actually, that dragline fiber that spiders hang from, it approaches the tensile strength of steel. Hmm. Okay. So super strong, also elastic. So you can stretch this fiber without it breaking. That means that the amount of energy it takes to break a silk fiber, hundreds of times more than the amount of energy it takes to break Kevlar. Wow. So these are amazing, amazing fibers. Okay, now there's silks that make the drag line, but there's also silks used to wrap eggs. There's silk used in the capture spiral. Um, a black widow spider, which is the species that I work with, can actually make five different types of fibers. Hmm. And each fiber has slightly different properties. And those different properties are good, you know, could have different applications. So these proteins, when made into a fiber, have amazing material properties. And there's a lot of interest in mass producing these silk fibers for a lot of applications. Mm. So textiles, um, uh, super lightweight body armor, um, uh, sutures that are very, very fine, and the body won't reject them because they're just protein. Uh, uh -huh. um, uh, a matrix for, for regenerating cells. Um, my students actually found some really great applications the other day that I hadn't even heard of. They're actually trying to have silk grow with tissue so that uh, instead of having like a body armor, it's more like a second skin that you're wearing. Wow. Um, uh, ropes, mm -hmm. um, tendons, ligaments. Mm. So these, these, all these different applications that would be desirable to make use of spider silk. Mm. 
but the problem is that spiders are cannibalistic and, and they're also predators. So if you think about like what kind of animals do we farm, we don't farm wolves. Mm -hmm. We farm cows and sheep and things that eat plants. We can't really, it's not that wolf meat wouldn't taste good. It's that wolves, we'd have to be feeding the meat all the time. We're willing to do this with our dogs, but we're not really willing to do it for a food item. Right. Um, so we can't really farm spiders. They'll kill each other. We can't keep them in high densities. It's very expensive to keep them. Um, there's this great display of this golden shawl, but it required something like silking from 10,000 different spiders. Wow. In, in 10 years to actually get all the silk. Um, so instead, if we could isolate the genes mm -hmm. for these silks, um, get some other organism to make the protein for us in massive quantities, then we could now actually do all of these applications that we're interested in. Hmm. So I personally don't do that part of the research. I don't actually express the proteins and um, make all these artificial fibers. But what I do is discover the genes that are making silk fibers and um, try to figure out what their functions are, what roles do these different genes have in making a fiber. And then once I've discovered the genes, or the students in this case have characterized the genes, then we can insert it into a little circular piece of DNA, have a bacteria grow it for us, and then next step is you know, proceed to making the protein and testing mm. what it does and seeing if we can improve um, artificial silk production. My. So that's what they do in the lab. Mm -hmm. And okay. they work with various genes um, associated with silk production. And a lot of them are ones that have not been published yet. So they really are working with new, new information. Wow, that's so exciting. Yeah. So you have to get actual spiders to work on, correct? <laughs> So, so I had at one time gotten actual spiders to work on. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it, it starts with dissecting the, the glands that actually make the silk, isolate the RNA that's used to trans that's actually right. translated into mm -hmm. protein, do various methods to turn it back into DNA, do various more methods to be able to characterize the genes. And the students learn all about these various methods. So at what point in your work, maybe as a grad student, maybe in somebody's lab, at what point did you realize, wow, spider silk, this, <laughs> this is what I'm going to spend my, my career on, at least for the next five years, 10 years, whatever it might be. Yeah, so when I was, when I was looking for graduate programs, mm -hmm. I, was, I was just interested in the genetics of ecologically important traits. And I started off working on uh, a species of spiders, a species of spider that had these interesting behavioral traits. Hmm. Um, desert spiders were fearful, and riparian spiders were, or sorry, desert spiders were aggressive, and riparian spiders were fearful. And I, I was like, oh, I want to know the genes for these behavioral traits. Well, it turned out that was really hard, and we just didn't have the resources because we just had no resources about DNA for spiders, which is very, very, very hmm. minimal. And behaviors turn out to be complex traits. They are inherited, but they're controlled by multiple genes. So it's not such a simple like gene, protein, right. trait. Okay. Um, so when I was looking for a postdoc for, for um, a job after I got my PhD, I came across uh, Cheryl Hayashi's lab at UC Riverside. She was advertising for a position, and she worked with spider silk. I said, oh my God, I found it. Why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> you know, here is, wow, these fibers are extremely important for the ecology of spiders. And they're made of protein. So we know we, we, know we can go into the DNA and find the genes that hmm. code for these proteins. It turns out to be much more complex than I initially thought. Hmm. But you know, so, that's, so she, t she gave me a job and it's just gone from there. Wow. All right. All right. Well, it does sound complex, but you've explained it very carefully and very um, intriguingly to me. So I'm sure I speak for our audience to say thank you once again for joining us and sharing this great course with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. All right.